Distributed along the coastal waters along the eastern United States, the fluke or summer flounder is found from the shallows to relatively deep waters from Massachusetts to South Carolina. Georgia and Florida feature the southern flounder. In the ocean, fluke are found in deeper waters of 25 to 50 fathoms during the early fall to late spring. During the summer months, fluke frequents shallower waters. The fluke is believed to spawn in late winter to early spring depending upon geographic location. Fluke also frequent the sandy and muddy bottoms of bays and rivers, preferring the shallower waters in late spring and early fall seasons. Fluke move into channels and deeper water during the heated days of summer. Fluke, sometimes called summer flounder, are the mainstay of the summer inshore sport fishing scene on much of the East Coast. In the spring, fluke move from their wintering grounds on the continental shelf to shallow bays and estuaries along the coast. Flukes spawn during the winter on the continental shelf and juveniles migrate to the inshore waters with the rest of the population. These fish, when they're coming in, you know, as the season starts, the water gets warmer, they're coming in basically from the continental shelf. Yeah. But how come it's always the bay's going to get the fish first versus out here in the water where you know they're passing to get into the bays and all the inlets and everything? Well, they, they don't. Water temperature is, is a, a roadway for them from the continental shelf into these bays. And, you know, that has a lot to do with uh, the way they're feeding patterns, too. You know, they don't feed particularly well in the colder water. So in the spring, like we have now, you know, it's the end of May, early May and things like that, you want to fish in them deep back base because the water temperature rises quicker and warms up faster. So those fish feed better than they would say in the ocean. Are you uh, talking about the shallows back, the eight, the 10 feet of water? Yeah, you wanna, you wanna fish anywhere from say six to 14, 15 feet. Okay. No more than that early, really early. You know, and surprisingly this year, they're feeding in the ocean, you know, but the temperature's up. It's up to about almost 62 degrees. And, um, you know, those fish don't usually turn on out here until, you know, mid-June or so because of the water temperature, you know. And surprisingly this year it bumped up. We had that, that really good shot of 90 degree weather for a little while there and that helped the fishery out here in the ocean, you know. But they do start in the back bays and then they work their ways out into the main channels of the bay and, and then they start feeding out here in the ocean, you know. That's a pretty one. That's look what it's all about. Look at how thick they are. Look how thick they are. That's a beautiful animal. You know, and Gary, how soon do you get these things? When, when does this bite really begin on these fish? You know, I, I got like t the last two weeks of May and all of June. I have a six-week window for the big wow. guys. Really? And then That's not a bad window. No, no. <laughs> six weeks and, and we produce these fish every single day. So I know this starts really early, the bite here. Rich, you got one on? Yeah, just hit one. Um, I know this starts fairly early. What, what's the earliest people can come out here and do this? Down, we're in the vineyard here right now, right? Oh, about uh, the second week of June, fish start showing up. A lot of times uh, uh, you'll see a mix of sizes all together as they first move in, and then they segregate out between uh, different areas and, and you'll see uh, bigger fish in the deeper water as the season progresses and smaller fish up in the shallow. Fluke have a varied diet of just about anything that swims. This varied diet means that all types of natural bait and artificials can be productive. Today was great because we're putting a focus on shallow water fluke fishing and they're so aggressive and they're just a dynamite species uh, to catch because they'll cooperate. They'll feed on live bait, they'll feed on a lot of different artificials, and uh, they're a loyal fish. Nothing is as savage, really, and as, I don't mean to attribute human qualities to these fish, but really, when it comes to what fluke do to feed, they have all of the proper armament. They have 
the ability to camouflage, so they're an ambush feeder. But when you watch them and observe them underwater, you'll see that they will move from spot to spot looking for the perfect ambush point. And when they find that ambush point, then they'll, like a chameleon, they'll blend right into the bottom. Any hapless bait fish that comes within the right strike zone, and this is what's so really important to consider as a fisherman, is that your bait has to be right on the bottom. Because when they're ambushing, they're generally on the bottom, they're blending in, and they're waiting for something to come within their strike zone. A two foot long fluke is going to come off the bottom no more than a fish and a half length. So that's three feet off the bottom. If your jig is drifting way up off the bottom, they're not going to go after it. They're not going to expend the energy. But when they do strike, they come off the bottom like a cobra. They come off the bottom with such speed, it's absolutely mind boggling. When a fluke does ambush something, they'll oftentimes commit themselves only when it's in that strike zone, but once they're amped up, they will chase it down. They will doggedly pursue it. When you first feel that heaviness, that means that they've actually struck the bait. But look at their teeth. They're not designed to chew, to cut, to sever. They're only designed to hold. So when you feel heaviness, that means it's grabbed the prey, but they don't gulp it down right away. You'll have a hesitation. They'll swim away with it. That's when, all of a sudden, they'll gulp it down. So the best suggestion that I can give any angler is when you first feel the heaviness, wait just a second or so and then set the hook. Don't immediately have that impulse, feel heaviness, strike. It may be just swimming off with it in its mouth sideways. You won't get purchased with the hook. The hardest fluke to catch is the first fish. You know, you, you get the first fluke, and, and generally they're always in that same area that you find the first one. Yeah, and then you punch them on the GPS, you take a quick range, uh, hopefully maybe there's something in the water, like a buoy nearby, yeah, and just key on that. That's important. Bobby, you mentioned that earlier, where if you get a Clorox bottle or a buoy from a bait shop, they sell them now with the lines on them and the sinkers, and if you get a fish like that, you just throw the buoy over and you work around that buoy, because they're very rarely alone. That's it. You know, years ago, before we had all this fancy electronics, that's the way we did it. <laughs> shore ranges, right? Yeah, shore ranges. And, and, and that's not works. a very tough thing to do. If you, if you align two points in one direction and two points in another direction, you're going to pretty much always get right on that same spot. We'll put you on this spot. I love this spot over here, first of all, because there's no boat traffic. <laughs> that's always a plus. Uh, secondly, so um... I'm constantly looking at the charts, and uh, I like to pick, pick air areas where we have a lot of structure. Uh -huh. uh, where there's structure, there's bait. Where there's bait, there's ledges. And uh, pretty much that's how I pick my spots. It would be to reach back and hit that, that machine. I'm going to just, I'll mark our spot. I'm John, you got it? There yeah, you go. There Perfect. Go. Got it now. You know, and, and you know, that, that's something you should talk about, Andy. Is how important is that, you know? Well, if you can, if you can mark every time you hook a fish, Sometimes you can just establish a lane that the fish are laying in and just work your drifts along that. Now, our fish will be very close to keeper, maybe a little bit shy, but we're going to let this one go anyway. Yeah, I think that you. we all had cookie cutter fish there. Yeah. But it's a sign of life anyway, so we'll get him back in the water and we'll get some bait back out. But uh, yeah, you know, it, it's you see the trend. You like I always said the hardest fluke to catch is the first one, you know, because if you find one, you're generally going to find others around them. People don't realize, John, these are actually a school fish. I mean, you know it. You see it by us, right? Absolutely. Uh, it's yeah, predators, they're predators, too. Away. They're going to lay in wait. You know, you're going to come over them, they're going to they're gonna wrap you. So, what was that, Eddie? Well, they're all going to lay in a lane. They're going to lay over a specific area. And, you know, sometimes that area, when it turns on, if you're able to stay on that and keep going back and forth, catch every last fish in that spot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, John, you you and I, we've seen them on the, in a the Western Sound like... I call it on a dime. Right. You know, you'll have like a little radius where them fish are laying. And you know, you make that drift. And you'll notice a lot of times when people are drifting too, they'll make a drift, they'll hook a fish, they'll go right back up. If you look at it, as soon as you get to that same spot, you had the last one. Right. There, there. That's why we stem in the Western Sound. That's yeah. that's yep. why. Oh, so oh, oh, nice one, Johnny. Nice fish. That was a nice set, nice everything. Yeah, Woo, we're not we're done. It's a little different. We don't have a lot of structure here. We're over this open bottom. And oh. we're trying to cover a lot of bottom here. 
So stemming isn't the best idea. And also, with with this current, you know, sometimes it's a little even. It's I might, even I might grab an FT on this one, John. I, I look like a decent. Yeah, it's a little better, so a little better than last. Here you go, buddy. But you notice these fish have a tendency to like lay together. You'll pick one good fish. There's usually a couple more right around. Oh, absolutely. Fish. Big class of fish always swim together. Absolutely. Matter of fact, if, you, if I hook up on one fish, there's going to be a few fish around him. He's going to see this one fish on a little feed frenzy. They're going to jump right in after. It's that competition you know thing. I look back on the screen right now, and I see like every now and then we get a patch of bait. And you know, every time we've seen bait on that screen, we've found a fish or two right around him. And those bait patches aren't very big either. So it's a small patch of bait, we get to stay on them. What makes this the right spot here? This time of the year, a lot of the nicer fish drop off into the deeper water. There's bait down tight to the bottom. So off some of the drop-offs of the shoulder, shoulder water, it drops down to 80, 90, even 100 feet in places. And uh, the nicer fish drop down into the cooler water when the shallower water is too warm. So on that, that on that, not too bad. On his hook, uh -oh. quick release. Try on that stinger hook again that he just pulled off. I think we haven't seen too many rats over here. Yeah. Everything seems to be pretty good. Now, Joe, if we went in the shallows, we find fish there. They might not have the size that we're seeing out here. Yeah, generally you'll see plenty of fish in the shallow water this time of the year, but the size is uh, substantially smaller. Obviously, GPS so important. It's really not. It, you can take a range here, but it takes time to look around and find it. We hit those that one fish that had to be about damn near eight pounds, nine pounds. But we put it in the GPS. We drift it over that spot again, and we caught fish and we missed fish. And we're a long way off that spot yeah, now. We're gonna. We, we, I think we're dragging a few fish on it. Yeah, I think we. But, we Dave's oh, certainly dragging a couple. Yeah, we, we are gonna pick up right now and get right back on that drift. And we're gonna keep this drift short. Yep. And this is a technique. You know, a lot of guys like to let a drift go forever and ever because they put their feet up and they relax. Hey guys, this is about catching the right fish here today. We're gonna keep this drift right where we know the fish are. We're gonna keep it short. And I don't know, but I'm gonna pound the heck out of these fish today. I feel it. You find pieces of hard bottom. One thing about big fluke, it's not about always fishing the sandy bottom, it's about no. finding structure. Yep. The biggest fluke are always on structure. Here they're on a channel edge in 85 feet of water. Dave, you working a fish already? Uh, I had a little bite. Let bite. me see if I can steal that fish from <laughs> you. Know, I'm, here you, for you. I'm here you, to help. You and I have said this a thousand times. Oh, you got him, Dave? Messed him. You That's and I okay. have I got said him this on me. A, th a thousand times over, you know, and, and, and it's so true. Big fluke are no different than a big bass. They're, they're uh, uh, a pr obviously a predator, they're obviously lazy. And, you know, they're not going to spend time with the smaller fish chasing small bait around. They want a big presentation in an area. And, and what they're going to do is they're going to look for that one kill on a tide, that one big bite. I mean, yeah. how many times have we pulled a 10, 12-pound fluke, see him spit out a whole 40? Right. Or a, a Something whole, that we never yeah, thought he could eat. Blackfish, yeah. the ball. You know, they, they want to make that one kill. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, they're no different from us, Andy. No, we want to eat, we want to oh. sleep. Tide should be good, about an hour is going to be high water. You got a nice little drift, you're going to be drifting about 0.5 to 0.8, which is uh, pretty ideal for the fluke fishing. You know, there's reports they're catching a couple here off Long Beach, so I'm going to give it a shot, and see what happens. Yeah, we don't want to get too close to this edge here, we'll just lose every rig, so we're going to get right on that drop, and hopefully these fish are holding tight. Yeah, a lot of times they, they, they hold real tight to the wall there. And, once you drift off of it, you just got to go back up, do a couple short drifts, and uh, you know you, you keep tight, and you should get a couple. We just made the move here, Bobby. You said the current slacked off at that last spot. Right. So we moved into a little bit more current. We're in Orient Point. Bob Rochetta. Bob, you got a, something playing with you there? Oh, yeah. Well, there, you hey, there you go, Bobby. There you go. Once again, that nice slow lift. You felt some weight, and boom, fish on. And a nice slow retrieve. Let the drag work. That's one thing that's very important. You really, it's an old saying with fluke, the first one to the top don't win. You want to just take your time and keep steady pressure on the fish and get them to the surface. Oh, on that a, bad fish pot? Oh, on not the a ball, bad fish. guys, on the ball. Yeah, got it on, uh, got it on the fluke bullet. Bring it right over here, Will. Hey, Lanny, why don't you get that one? Here we go. We'll leave the to the net. There, there you go. go. Good job, Bobby. All yours. Thank you. Thank you. That was nice, Bob. You called that perfect. You said, you know, like we just said, there's a little bit more current on this end, so we, we pulled over, we moved over into here, and well, we were in here, what, two minutes, and you got that fish right on. He said, 
And I see we got a little bit of a rip line through here, and there's certainly some bait on the screen. Oh, there we go. Oh, nice. That nice. was solid. That looks like a good fish. Ooh, it feels like a good fish. Ooh, now yeah. that's what you like to see. You know, it's so yeah. Oh, he's just staying down. That's exactly what you... You know what, Andy? I'm definitely going to need a net for this fish. Oh, I got it. I got it right here. I actually got one playing with mine, but I, I, I got you. He's it's just, very important he's just to come up steady down. on these fish. Nice, slow, and steady. Just keep pressure on the fish. Keep the rod vertical. Bobby, uh, this was a good call. Well, hopefully it'll get better. He's cycling. He's cycling. Oh, oh nice here fish. That's a good fish. We're going to bring right Once again, here. head first. There we go. Right up nice the job, Andy. Nice job. I got we seem to be holding. What, what are you doing to keep us in the spot? Well, you know, Andy, this, since this current picked up a little bit, we're still using them two-ounce bucktails. What I'm doing is I'm just putting the back of the motor into the tide and just slowing us down a little bit. And it seems we can keep our bucktails straight up and down under the boat just by working the motor back and forth a little bit. And these bucktails are a lot more effective when worked straight up and down. Oh, yes, most definitely. When you, uh, when you get a bucktail too far away from the boat and you get a lot of scope in your line, a lot of times it'll run to the side. So basically what you want to do is stay right up on top of it, and it makes for a much truer hook set. And, and, the, and the least amount of line that you have out, the, obviously the better the hook set, and the better you're able to, be able to feel the fish and in every in individual bite. Most, most definitely. It's very important. Obviously we talked about it before, Bobby touched on it. Stay in contact with your bucktail. And if you can stay straight up and down on it, you're going to notice your hookup ratio is going to be much better. Yeah, a lot of times we see guys flying along in a wild, fast drift, and they are, in fact, trying to keep their bucktails on the bottom. The only problem is it's just not a good presentation. You know, at, at that point in time, they're almost better taking off the bucktail and putting maybe a six or an eight ounce sinker on it. Right. And if you do find a body of fish and you are stemming the way we are right now, you can stay on that body of fish for a lot longer before the, the, the tide and the drift take you off of it. Is we're going to keep an eye on this machine. You can see we ran over some structure here. Right now we're in 42 feet of water. We got wind against tide, so what we're going to do is we're going to pull this boat in reverse with the tide. So we're going to set up right up on this high spot here. We're going to drift down this ledge and we're going to see if we can pick a few fish. One of the keys to fishing this way, especially with these light bucktails, is we've got to make sure we keep our presentation as vertical as possible. Most definitely. So we're going to be running the motors so almost the whole time. So contact with the bottom. Yep. All the time. These okay. are, like I said, I mean, I know you've seen fluke, but you haven't caught one. But okay. these are, they're, they're flat, as, uh, flat as can be. So I'm going to turn one motor off. We're going to keep one motor in gear. And what we're going to do now is we're going to put our baits down. I got this one baited already. And what we're going to do is we're going to hit the bottom, freeze it there, and a lot of tip motion on this rod. Keep that bucktail moving and we're gonna actually pull ourselves in reverse with the drift. Okay. We're gonna have to look for them in a little while, I think. You know, I, I notice there's a lot of water out here, a lot of places to fish, and you, at different stages of the, t of the tide, do different spots produce better or worse? Definitely, I mean, I usually look for Bigger fish at the change of a tide an hour before the change. I always seem to notice you catch the biggest of the fish. You might be catching shorts for two hours. All of a sudden, the tide will ease up, and then all of a sudden, you see a big fish show up. Uh, you know, we see that with a lot of other species as well, not just the fluke. Yeah, most definitely. It's almost like the, the smaller fish will turn a little bit less active as the tide draws out, and it's like the bigger fish almost take the opportunity to feed. Yeah, and they jump in. Yep. It's a really good agree point, with Rich. That. Definitely seems like bigger, a little less aggressive. Oh, oh nice see, set. all we needed was a little moving water. And the tide turned around and finally started to move again. And all of a sudden, these fish are starting to feed. And I think they were here the whole time. It's just they weren't moving on that slack water. Yeah, they'll just lay down there a lot of the times. You'll pick occasional one or two, but when that tide starts running, that's when they get hot. I mean, that looks like a pretty decent fish. Rich, right this is the biggest one I've caught today. Oh, that is a good oh, fish. That is nice. All right. I'm surprised you ain't got a pair of lips. I am, I'm surprised you ain't got a pair of lips on that fish after that set. I'm wow. pretty impressed with that. Nice fish. Show me a little. Very solid. Keep his head under the surface. There you go. And once again, the Lip. tide is very important in this kind oh. of fishing. Nice fish. That's beautiful. We need a moving tide. Fish are going to pretty much bite okay. and be a lot more active than they are on a standing tide. I'm going to help you with him. You got him. You good, Tim? And sometimes you got to be a little patient in some of the spots and ah. maybe move a little east, a little west. Wow. Tim, that might be one more for the table. Think we ought to eat that one, Rich? Yeah. I, I ain't turning it down. You want to go to supper? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we talked about this briefly before, Tim. 
it seems like you get that hard moving tide, these fish will turn on. You know, around here in the sound, it seems like the further east you go, the worse you do on the moon, and the further west you do, then you go, the better you do on the moon. Because you get a lot more tide down in the west where you normally don't have a lot of tide. And we're kind of midway here. We're not all the way down in the west. We're out a bit, about a bit. But there's certainly, we've moved to where we felt we could get enough current and really start catching these fish. No. The tide's turned around here. We're starting to get the current moving again. It's starting to happen. Moving water's everything to this fishery, isn't it? You know, it, it's so important. I mean, you can catch them on a dead tide when there's a lot of fish around, but for the most part, you always want that tide to be moving. Oh, Rich, that's a nice fish. That's not too bad. No, that's that enough. Not too shabby. Not too bad, not too bad. You know, this is, one thing I've noticed also, we talk about this a lot, Andy and I, you notice the, the bigger fish, they always come right at the change of the tide or right at the end of the tide also. I mean, you can pick a good fish during the tide, but it seems like that real moose, you always get like the last maybe half hour, hour of the incoming or outgoing. Yeah, it's like the they wait till right caught. near the end of the tide where it's easy for them to get a good meal. And then they just seem to turn on. Some nice people fish. may think it's a simple seeing us drop these bucktails down and catch these nice fish, but I watch you guys in your electronics, your boat maneuvering. It's very complicated to be on these fish when the water turns. That's you know, not easy. You know, for this type of fishing, you're right, it does. It, it can get a little complicated. But, you know, in general, though, this is probably, right now, I would say, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the most sought after recreational fish on Long Island right now. You know, there's a lot of them around. You get in the right spots, a lot of fun. Any, anybody can catch these fish. Yeah. But in some spots like this, we're going for a little bigger fish. This takes a little bit more work. I'm gonna eat that fish. I'm gonna help <laughs> right. I just tell them the way it is. I'm gonna eat that fish. <laughs> All right, guys, you know what? I wanna slide us back onto that piece one more time. All right. And if you could just reel it up there, let's just drive right up onto that piece. You got we'll it. go over it again. I'm hoping, Rich, you didn't pull the only big fish that was on there off that piece. Well, you know what, Andy, that's quick also. These fish very rarely swim alone, too. So if there's one there, there should be more. It's not bad. Nice looking fish. You know why we're starting to catch now, too? Before, we were drifting to the west. Now the tide turned, and this is my favorite tide. We're drifting to the east, and we're going down the hump. Fish are always on the back side of a hump. And it's a good idea. Like We stayed with this. Even though the bite wasn't good, we were kind of picking away. Is it? Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, they got to clean the bottom. We're just kind of picking away. The lights. tide's turned. And you know what? Sometimes you stay on a spot. The fish are there. They're just waiting for the, a slightly different presentation. Yeah, that's it. It was worth sticking it out. You know, we, we said that before. Sometimes they like a bait moving a certain way also. Yeah. You know, it's, it's they don't want it going with the wind. They want it going with the tide. Yeah, sometimes maybe they'll lay, it's how they're laying on the bottom as well. Yeah, I think that's got a lot to do with it, Andy. It's like somebody hits the dinner bell and says, okay, guys, it's time to oh, eat. Oh. oh, there we go. Keep that rod moving. Make that bait look as, as live as you can. And, you know, you can definitely induce these fish to strike up on you. Yeah, it's amazing how aggressive they can be sometimes. And at other times, you know, you feel like you got to induce that fish. You're like, you're wiggling in front of him. He touches it. He hits it. And other times, they just jump right on the bait. You want a net there, Rich? No, I think I can handle him. It's not a bad fish, though. There we go. Ooh, lively. On a fast tide, I think you should move the bait less. On a slower tide, bounce it a little more. That's I got what you. I usually like to do. I think it's because that fast tide gives the, gives the bait a little more action because, you know, you, your bait's zooming along the bottom. You know, it's, there's a lot of current. It's got a lot of life to it. You know, we are using dead baits on the slow tide. You want to give it whatever you can. Now, the other thing, Barbara, I noticed, I mean, I typically, I don't know, for some reason I have a tendency to work in what I call a fast bucktail. Uh, I notice you're slow it down a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all, I guess, depending on how the fish are feeding, if they're more active, you can work a little quicker, if they're you a little know, lazier. I, I find if I got an aggressive bite, I'm constantly, constantly working the raw tip. That's a if, good point. Uh, if they're a little bit sluggish, I'm just leaving it down and just doing a little twitch every now and then. Yeah, that, no, that's a great point yeah. to make because, you know, and you have to switch it up because, you know, there are days where a fast bucktail is yeah. going to outfish a slow bucktail or vice versa. Absolutely. You know, it's so important when we're fishing these bucktails, keep that bucktail as vertical as possible. The presentation is just so much better. Uh oh, there's one. Hey, there you go. That's a fish. Well, and, you know, Gary. Yeah. I, we've got you working the throttle, and you're just basically. What are you looking for here to to know that you're stemming the boat properly? Oh, you have to. You know, it's called power drifting. This way, you stay right on top of your jig. You're never more than an inch or two off the bottom. 
And you're basically just making sure that the line is staying vertical all the time. Presentation is important also, uh, you know, whether you're fishing a bucktail or even if you're fishing, you know, baits like spearing or sand eels or squid strip, uh, you, want it, you want it to lay straight on the hook, you don't want it curled up, uh, you know, especially using things like gulp. Uh, I see a lot of people where, you know, they, they hook it up and it's curled up on the hook, it's at a 45 degree angle, it's going to spin, it's not attractive to the fish and it will affect your catch. Um, get it so that you can slide it up the barb enough when you push it through that it's laying straight on the hook, straight back. Um, and that goes with whatever rubber bait you're using on, uh, on a jig head or on a bucktail. And if you're putting bait on a, on a jig head, same thing, you know, spearing, you want that spearing straight off the hook. Take him, take him! No, nope. oh. I'm really struggling to hold the bottom here, even with braided line. Imagine if this was mono. It's a nice oh, fish. that's a nice solid fish. Yep, I got it. Rich, him. you got that? Yeah, I'll take him. I'm just trying to drop back on this fish. Let it spin him around, head first into the net. That's a good looking fish. I'll take that. Uh, there he comes, here he comes, here he comes. There's another one. There we go! Come There's on, Jamie, get him, baby! There's another one. I'm feeling a little left out about now. You know, back fish. in the day. You had opportunities. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> like, not like you haven't had hey, a shot. Rich, this is a big fish. I got the net for you, buddy. Back, what are you, what back are you in saying? The day when, back in the day, in the 70s, and used to come out here and try to fish this deep water with monofilament. Of course, you didn't even have the graphite rods you got today, fiberglass. You had to run across the boat to hook these fish. Yeah. <laughs> because getting a hook set was next to impossible. This, this braid of line is just, this has, has you, to be. You know what? Again, every trip Andy and I make, we talk about it one way or the other. Monofilament, basically chunking, live lining. Everything else, I mean, the braid just You need rolls. the braid, you need the thin line diameter, and you need the utter lack of stretch. <laughs> that fish probably felt better in this current. The current has uh, just turned here, and you know what? We are flying right now. Our drift speed's a mile and a half an hour, well, and I'm going to need to get the boat back in gear to get my bucktail down to the bottom. Uh, I'm yeah, you said yourself, you love fishing with the braid. Gotta love it. Yeah, it, it's just, you know, when you got no stretch, you feel everything. And again, oh, I just had a touch. Andy, you said to me before, like, wow, we just came off a high spot, just came down off the rocks. You just pick up everything, you really do. And the lack of water resistance means that you're going to have a much more vertical presentation. Your jigs are going to be a lot more effective. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, we got Gary stemming the tide here now. He's pulling us back in reverse, keeping our bucktails on the bottom. And like I said, we're fishing a two ounce pro and we're holding. And, you know, we said this before. People, what, did eight, 10 ounces of lead you need to get through here? Yeah, you tell people you're working. 60 to 90 feet of water with two, two and a half ounce of jigs, they laugh at they you. They look at you like you're crazy. Oh, right? yeah. They look at you like <laughs> you're what crazy. Are we? We're, in about, we're in about 55 feet of water right here. 55? Wow. And you know what? I, I feel like my buck, I can feel every move the bucktail. Well, look at it. Look at our lines. I mean, I'm straight up and down. I'm dropping back. I stopped. I mean, I'm straight up and down on my bucktail. And, you know, Andy, you and I talk about this all the time. When you're bucktailing these fish, the key to bucktailing is to be vertical, is to be right on top of these fish with the bucktail. You don't want to let it get too far away from the boat. You know what happens. Right. Well, your presentation really suffers. The bucktail can tend to land inside. And when it does, it's also going to get fouled a lot more easily yeah. on whatever and, and the breeze on the ratio. bottom. Your yeah. hookup ratio oh, goes down. Absolutely. 100%. Well, there's one fish we're not missing. <laughs> Rich, uh, Rich just uh, dropped his tip there when he got the hit. The we're drifting here at over a knot, and he dropped his tip to, to feed the bait back just for a second so the fish had an opportunity to go right up the bait, up to the hook. Yeah. Now, when you miss a hit, we're going a knot here. When you miss a hit, you almost always have to open your reel up and drop back and then work, start working your rig again. We're doing bucktails here because you're going a knot, and you're pulling away, oh, and you're pulling away from the fish so far. When they're ready. No, I missed them, and now is my chance to drop back to them. Yeah, you know, and with the bucktails, you, you want to keep them moving. You know, I see a lot of guys, they dead stick them. Bucktails are designed to be worked, you know. You, you see all these different rigs in the stores. They got the spinning glows and all that. They all work. There's no, this is a good fish. There, there's no two ways about it. But what that does is it puts action on a bait that you should be putting on yourself. That's so right. by you working that rod, you know, you're adding action. You get those adrenaline strikes and you get those lethargic fluke to hit. Guys, I'm going to need the net. This is all a good right, fish. I'm going to get the, Joe, I, got hooked, get I got them barely hooked on just the teaser hook. Just the teaser hook on this fish. Joe, I'm going to need you. This is a nice fish, Joe. I'm going to swing him. Yeah, you go. Get him in it, Will. Woo! 
That's a beauty. Nice fish. Uh, that's solid. Oh! Dude, look where I had him hooked, boys. Woo! Right under the chin. Right with the, with that that stinger hook in the back again. I got him right under the chin. I had him hooked in the center. Look at that. The bucktail pulled out, and that that stinger, stinger saved hook you. saved you. Woo! I'll take it. That's a nice one. That's a nice looking fish right there. Not super big, but let me know when you're ready. Yep. Right. Yep. You're reeling your fish up here. You want to go head first into the net. What you want to do is you want to grab the middle of your rod here, keep the, the fish right under the surface, and drag the fish into the net. Don't go bringing, don't go chasing the fish with the net. You want to bring the fish to the net, not the net to the fish. Never head first. Net tail. Exactly. Head first is very important. These fish have a tendency to get to the top and people try and net them and they, they scramble all over. Real good looking fish. Wow, Bobby. Bobby, I tripled. <laughs> well, I couldn't oh, let you guys do that fish? Well, actually, you know what? We'll leave that net for Bob. My fish isn't quite uh, as big. Don't get the gaff for Bob. <laughs> you got a good one in? <laughs> now, this is what it's all about. This is oh. Orient Point fluke fishing. Come on, baby. A little drag. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Andy, I want to put him down. Let's just drop that down. We'll He's take care of him in a second. Him. A little drag out on this guy. Now, Bob, you're going to lead that fish this right is... into the net for me, right? What's the pool today? I don't know. I think you might have it. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I when... think this is one of the better ones we've seen today. Now, what you want to do with this fish, Bob, you know as well, obviously, you know. You yeah. want to just lead his head directly into the net. Steady mm -hmm. pressure on the fish. Here he comes. That is a good fish, Bobby. He's got him right on the bullet. You, you know, jump, we're fi jump on the fluke bullet. Yeah, we're fishing Whoa, a big bullet here on the trailer. But... Uh, I'm going to go. Nice, I'm in. nice, I'm in. Good, good fish, Bobby. Good, right. very good, good fish. Good. I'm gonna back that line off. We'll bring him in. Bring him in. That's a good-looking fish. A little bit of touch oh, there. Yeah. I got one laying here now. Oh, guys, that feels a little bit better, guys. That's nice. got some weight to it. Oh, that's nice. Actually, I think Rich just drew first blood, Andy. <laughs> I think so. Feeling well, like a fluke, also, guys. It's looking like a fluke got that now. A little bit of chatter on the tip. Let's see what we got here. I'm curious to see if he took the squid or the bucktail. I'll one tell thing you, when you when you set up on these fish, when you got the bucktail also. You know, oh, there he goes. You got it. You got to set, but you can't set too hard. Right. Because you got the trailer hook on the back now too. You got to do that in between set, so it's a little bit different than what we're used to. Wow, look at all the, the bait, bait in the water, water right here, Andy. Oh wow, what is that spearing? Or? Yeah, look at it. Well, guys, look. I got color on it. This is a nice fish. John, you got the net down? Yeah, I want to have the So I got a little bit of a touch here. It's on the bucktail, dude. This is good. This is a solid fish right here, guys. This is a very solid fish. Johnny, I'm going to lead him head first right into the net, so I'm going to spin it, him. Buddy. You ready? Here we go. That's a good fish. That's the way to start the day. There you go. That's blood there, buddy. Solid the fish. Tail. Okay. Fluke here, you want to start on the white side. See? You know? Get a good grip on them. Kind of want to grip inside the gill there. You got your shoulder here, your back fin. You want to make a nice slow cut. You know, make sure you get most of the shoulder meat there. You're going to stick your knife on the white side of the, the skeleton. Slide your knife down the backbone here like that. Nice and easy, see? Push it in. Push all the way through, you let the knife do the work. Come back, get a swipe there, go through the uh, stomach bone here. Just keep your knife nice, nice and nice and flat. And that's it, there's one of your fillets. Get all the meat off there. You know, you want to make sure that you get all your shoulder meat, get all your meat on each side, that's all. Nice clean fillet. Same thing on the other side. Get up on your shoulder. You're going to do the same thing on this side. Just starting on the brown side. Go down. Just push your knife. You don't want to do much else. Just let your knife do your work. You go in. Just push. Push it right through. Coming up. Going right along the spine there. You put the tip of your knife on the other side of the spine. Get to the belly bone. A quick cut through there. Slide your knife down. That's it. There's the other side of your fillet. You want to be able to see right through it. 
I like to come here and take off your ribbons. You know, you could use these two ribbons here for your uh, next fishing trip. You know, they use those as for the fluke strips and stuff like that. Come with your fillet knife. Just start on the, the skinny end, the tail end. Get a little start to it. Use the skin as a grip. And same thing, use your knife. Let the knife do the work. Cut out your belly bone. There's a nice, beautiful fillet fluke ready for the dinner table. So Sean, listen, I have never seen anybody fillet fluke as fast as you. So what do you say we have a little game right now? Let's time you and see how <laughs> fast you can do one whole fish. All right, let's do it. You up for the challenge? Yeah, let's go. All right, you tell me when. I'm going to hit start. Ready to go. Fourteen seconds. <laughs> this is just one way to fillet a fluke. There's numerous ways to do this. I do it this way because it's very easy, requires like zero skill, uh, and it's easy to do without wasting any meat. So uh, that's why I use this technique. On this cut you'll notice that I'm avoiding the stomach area because I don't want to get any stomach contents mixed in with the fillet. So that's what that part is right there between um, where the cut is and the head. That's the stomach area. Skinning the fillets is very easy. Uh, get a firm hold on uh, the very back end. Get the knife up against the skin and then while holding with one hand, just slide the knife along with the other and uh, the skin will come right off the fillet. And A nice thing about doing this is that some of the, the red meat, if there's any on the fillet, will tend to stay with the skin and the red meat is not usually um, very tasty. 